plane had half an hour's stop in Albuquerque. Time enough for a fast breakfast. Then I saw the headline. Cooch was a very good friend. He'd always told some pretty tall stories, but this time I had the feeling he'd gone too far. In fact, far enough to get into serious trouble. I headed for the Circle J Ranch. Dallas would have to wait. Maybe Cooch had seen a flying saucer, only I was very doubtful. Cooch, by habit, was prone to make the new West as exciting as the old. Cooch's latest tale had become a national headline, and that, in the eyes of some people, could cease to be funny. It's been a long time since you were here, Mr. Lanyard. I wish I could make it more often. Oh, well, by the way, I don't have any riding clothes with me. Well, it's all right. We have a men's shop at the annex now. Good. Is uh, Cooch around? I'd like to talk to him. He's at the stables. Old Cooch, he's a sly one, all right. Certainly knows how to get publicity for the ranch. Our business has doubled since that story broke in the newspapers. Everybody wanting to see a flying saucer. Maybe they will. I found Cooch spinning a tail for some Indian boys. He hadn't changed. Neither had his stories. This here Indian, he walked into the group. He swelled up his brisket and gave out with a hoop that bounced around the valley and dang near onto two turns of the moon. And then that the lovely, lovely flower, flower of a girl came a running slap dab into his arm. <laughs> Mike, Mike Lanyard, you old dude. <laughs> Right, boys. See you later. I bet the last five generations of Apaches have heard that story. Yeah, more like six. Seems you've heard it a couple of times yourself. Yeah. Yeah, don't look much different, boy. Just as puny as ever. <laughs> what brought you out to a man's country? You? And what I read in the papers? Oh. I'm giving the straight skinny about that, Mike. Huh? I seen it just before dawn. I seen it come down, that saucer thing. Whoosh! That made these jet boys look like they was driving a plow horse. Sure you're not stretching things a little. I was just laying out there looking at the morning stars and thinking about putting on the coffee pot. Well, here it comes. Uh -huh. What did it look like exactly? Well, it was drowned, fire coming from all around, and it made a gosh awful hissing sound. It would go this way a spell. This time he's come up with something even more fascinating. You mean the flying saucer story? I wouldn't take it too lightly. You've got to admit the cooch has a tendency to lean away from the truth at times. Perhaps this is the exception. I think you misunderstood. Perhaps, Mr. Lanyard. You see, I've the feeling you're poking fun at my uncle. And even if you're right, I don't like it. May I ask what's so funny? You. I've known cooch for a long time. I've heard him tell some pretty tall stories, and it never bothered me. This morning, when I read his statement in the papers, I was amused. And then I realized that perhaps he might need me, so I... Why would he need you? For two reasons. If his story's true, he's probably the only living person who's been that close to a saucer. And maybe that isn't healthy. And if it's not true, he'll have a lot of explaining to do to the authorities. I'm terribly sorry. I'd never thought about it that way. I'm glad you're here. Sleep good? Nothing like the ground to make you appreciate a bed. Uh, sometimes, Mike, you disappoint me. That's dude talk. Uh, speaking of disappointments, where's your flying saucer? I was sure we'd see it. Exactly where was it when you saw it? Then you do believe me, Mike. Where was it, Cooch? Well, first I saw it circling round, then I saw it land. Come on. I wondered how long it would take Cooch to tell me it was all a joke, but he played it straight. He walked me over some rough ground and he told me how he'd spotted the saucer. Cooch had to be kidding, and I knew it. I also knew that I had to find a way to keep him out of the trouble he was headed for. Uh, there's where I seen it, right over there. Let's go see if it left any marks. 
It couldn't have left a mark. Oh, why not? Because, Mike, it never touched the ground. It sort of hung suspended, just about two feet over the ground. What about the men you said you saw? They got off the ship. They had big heads and tiny bodies. Let's check for their tracks. Or were they suspended, too? Okay, Mike. I didn't see any men. I made that up. But honest, I seen the saucer. It was plain as day. It didn't stay more than a minute, but I swear, it's like I say, it landed and hovered over the ground. I guess I was so scared I froze to the earth. But I saw it, and you've just got to believe me. I can't say that I believe you, Cooch. I can't say that I don't. But you and I have a job to do, and we better do it fast. What kind of a job, Mike? Well, you realize, of course, that by now your story's been flashed all over the world. I didn't know it would be when I told the local reporter, but I guess you're right. Uh -huh. And you know that so far no one's ever come up with an answer to flying saucers. Guess so. Out here, Cooch, sleeping on the ground, looking up at a sky filled with stars, a man's imagination can run away with him. It gets so that anything seems right and possible. I don't blame you, Cooch. But I want to be sure no one else does. Uh, that's the job you said we got to do. Yeah. We're going back to the ranch. Then we're going to call your local reporter. You're going to tell him you thought things over. If you've decided what you thought was a flying saucer, it was really a falling star. If you think that's the thing to do, Mike, I guess I'll have to do it. But I swear to you, it wasn't no falling star. As we started back to camp, Cooch was upset. I wondered if it was because I didn't believe him, or if it was because I caught on to his joke. Either way, I didn't like it. I don't like a friend being a fool, or being made to look like a fool. All right, Cooch, let's go, huh? You go, Mike. You've got a date with Judy. I've got some tall thinking to do. You call the reporter, tell him to be at the ranch later, and I'll give him a new story. Like you said, the one about the falling star. Okay, Cooch. I'm sorry. Nothing to be sorry about. If you don't believe me, I know it's next to impossible for anyone else. That afternoon, Judith gave me a taste of the past. Maybe that's why I began to wonder if Cooch was telling the truth. I made a decision. Cooch was a friend, and right or wrong, I was going to go along with him. No reporters, no new statements. If the world believed he saw a saucer, why should I prove it a lie? This is only one of the caves in this part of the country, Mike. Imagine 10,000 years since they've been inhabited. Uh -huh. Before we started, you said these caves tied in with Cooch's story of the flying saucer. How? Well, the human mind is a funny thing, Mike. Sometimes it will only believe what its eyes reveal. Like this cave? Like what this cave represents. Civilized life here thousands of years ago. Some would refuse to believe that these people actually existed, unless they saw the proof. <laughs> At least there's proof. Before it's over, perhaps Uncle Cooch will find some proof as well. <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> I thought Cooch would be happy when I told him his flying saucer story was OK with me. Only I figured wrong. I tell you, it's fantastic. Carter found Cooch's horse, but Cooch was nowhere around. He wouldn't leave his horse in the desert. I know. Mike, what time did you leave Cooch? Early this morning. He said he wanted to do some thinking. He said he'd get back to the ranch later. Did he seem OK? Yeah, he seemed OK. I knew those flying saucer stories would get him into trouble. Don't do a man any good to talk too much. He'll be back. I think you're taking this too seriously. Do you really, Mike? Remember, you said it might not be healthy. I'm worried. In fact, I'm frightened. Yaga, why did you look for Coach? Well, he had an appointment to take some of our dudes for a ride. Ain't like him to forget. When he didn't show up, I just naturally went looking for him. How did you know where to look? Ever since he saw that flying contraption, he's been spending most of his time in that spot. And? Well, I found his horse and no sign of him. And then 
circled a mile or so in each direction, still no sign of them. Then I headed back to the ranch. It's like Kelly says. It ain't healthy to talk about them flying things. Mike, what do you think? What should we do? Let's go and examine the place carefully. There has to be a solution. It doesn't have to be a flying saucer. Wake me outside, will you? I didn't know what it was all about, but I wanted to find out. Then I saw the army, and by their manner, I knew they weren't on a holiday. And I got a break. I recognized the colonel. He was an old friend, Jack Davis. We'd known each other when a jet was still a blueprint. Hello, Shaggy. Mike Langard, well, of all people. <laughs> Haven't seen you since Anzio was 44. That was three promotions ago. Congratulations. Thanks. What are you doing these days? Right now, the same thing that you are. Looking for Goose Jeffords. Your being here, is it official? Yeah. And I think we'd better have a talk. Thank you. When you say the old man showed you the spot where he supposedly saw this object. Yeah, we stayed out all night. I didn't take it very seriously. Yeah, well, maybe you should have. Shag, the Air Force must get dozens of flying saucer reports. What's so special about this one? Two things. First of all, Jefford sent us a sketch. It's crude, obviously the work of a novice, but it ties in with the expert's designs of the type craft that might be capable of such performance. And the second thing? It was three days ago that Jefford said he saw the craft, 5.44 a.m. Well, Kutz didn't mention the time. He didn't have to. At that moment, our radar screens picked up the same object in the same locality it was flying at well over 2,000 miles an hour. What do you think? I'm Air Force, Mike. We want to know. I suppose I should have taken him more seriously. All I know is we have to find him. He has to tell us everything that happened. After that, maybe we'll have enough facts to start, as you say, thinking. Cooch told me the ship never landed. It stayed about two feet off the ground. I didn't believe him. According to our electronic engineers, that's very possible. You know, Mike, when something hits your radar screens at over 2,000 miles an hour, you quickly learn to believe things that might otherwise be incredible. Right now, I need Cooch Jeffords. We headed for Cooch's camp. We followed his trail until we lost it. Shag was all brass. He kept saying, these things just don't happen. I agreed. And he said he was going to have the Air Force photograph every inch of the ground. He was determined to find the answer and Cooch. I had another idea. It had nothing to do with planes or pictures. It had to do with a band of Mescalero Indians, part of the Apache tribe. I headed for the commissioner's office, and I kept wondering if I hadn't lost my mind. A lovable faker, flying saucers, radar screens, the military playing it for real, and a man just vanished into thin air. The commissioner gave me the name of the Mescalero chief, and he said something else. The chief was as modern as today, and a college graduate. All I hoped was that he hadn't forgotten how to track a trail almost as frail as a whisper. I am Charles Longbow. My name's Lanyard. This is Miss Jeffords. Of course, Big Tail's niece. Who? Uh, Big Tail is the name our people have given Mr. Jeffords. His stories have earned it for him. The commissioner told us you were the chief here. I am known as the chief. We came to ask your help. Coots Jeffords is missing. But he knows the desert as a man knows his own heart. It seems that something has happened over which he had no control. There is not a man among us who would not wish to help your uncle. He is a teller of wonderful tales to our children. You should have heard his accounts of riding with Cochise and Geronimo. A little before his time, weren't they? More than 50 years. But to the children, it makes no difference. I will help you. Good.
Longbow hadn't forgotten how to follow a trail. He followed Cooch's prints for at least two miles, then even he lost them. Longbow suggested we start afresh the next day. It wasn't hard to see that he was worried. The next day, we started out again. This time, Shag joined us. The result was the same. Longbow again lost the trail. I began to wish I'd never left Cooch. I didn't know where he was, but I felt that if I hadn't left him, this might never have happened. I'm afraid we're not going to find him. A man just can't vanish into thin air. If I remember correctly, you didn't believe Cooch's story either. Colonel Davis, Washington's on the phone. Will you take it here or in your room? Right here will be all right. Colonel Davis. Right. Goodbye. Air reconnaissance reports their photographs show nothing. And the Pentagon asked just one thing. Find Jeffords. We must find We must. Come on, Colonel. Let's keep looking. There must be an answer somewhere. searching for Cooch without any success. And the Air Corps hadn't been any more successful. I didn't have the answers, but I didn't believe a man could vanish into thin air. I suggested searching the caves. Anything was better than just waiting and wondering. We went through several caves. I was almost ready to call it a day, but I couldn't. I knew I'd never be able to forget Cooch's face when I'd said, we'll call it a falling star. I wasn't very proud of myself. Then we found a cave almost hidden. If this was it, what besides Cooch would we find? But it was like all the others, empty. These caves are very interesting. I'd like to come back again sometime when my mind's more at ease. Well, I don't believe anyone's been in here for hundreds of years. Mike, I thought you'd like to know. Before we started out this morning, I received confirmation on our first radar report from two other bases. You mean actual flying saucers? No, I didn't say that. The report simply confirms some object moving at a speed in excess of 2,000 miles an hour. You can understand why it's important for us to find Cooch Jeffers. Yeah. I shouldn't have left him alone. Well, there's no use blaming yourself. Maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe we'll find him. I hope so. went through two more caves, turned up nothing. It was as though a saucer had returned and taken Cooch away. I didn't like it when I thought about it. We entered the last cave in the desert. None of us expected anything. We were just going through the motions. Then I heard a noise or a voice. We headed for it. And I saw Cooch. He wasn't in trouble. He didn't even seem unhappy. I had been responsible for his disappearance, so I turned to Shag and said, He doesn't look any the worse for wear. How can he possibly explain this ridiculous action? Believe me, he'll have an answer. Do me a favor, will you? What? I was responsible for his disappearance. Let me handle it. It's irregular, Mike. But you've got the ball. Thanks. Hello, Coach. Well, I'll be darned. Hello, Mike. And Judith. Who are you? This is Colonel Davis. He was sent from Washington. He wants to talk to you. You know, Mike, I've been doing a lot of thinking about what you said to me. Guess maybe I do talk too much. So, Colonel, from now on, I got nothing to say. But I have a lot of questions you've got to answer. Sorry, Colonel. Got nothing to say. You know, Cooch, this might be the one time when you should have something to say. But you mean no falling star story? That's right, Cooch. No falling star story. Uncle Cooch, do you realize that half the Air Force and the entire staff at the ranch have been combing the country for you? Shucks, girl, don't you know your uncle can take care of himself? 
I had some thinking to do. I needed some quiet. But you've been gone three whole days. Time passes quickly when a man's thinking. How did you sustain yourself? You mean, how did I eat? Well, I've been coming to this cave for a long time. Each visit, I'd store a little more grub. Got enough stored away now to last for a long while. But why? Honey, a person's got to think ahead these days. All kinds of war talk, A-bombs, H-bombs. And when I saw that thing, I figured maybe this cave would come in mighty handy. Uh, now, Colonel, what is it you want to know? Your newspaper statement caused a lot of comment. Yeah, Mike said it would. You went on to say that you not only saw the saucer, but its crew as well. Is that correct? What do you say, Mike? Do you believe me? Just answer the Colonel's questions. Well, Colonel, only part of the story is true. I never saw any people. I said I did, just to add color. But the saucer, I saw. It was round, no windows, and it looked like it was on fire. Well, I'll need a full written report. Let's get back to the ranch. Uh, Mike, do you figure this will make the newspapers again? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Uncle's become somewhat of a celebrity. Well, that's right. And from the look of him, he's not going to let his public down. I only wish he'd settle down long enough to answer a few questions for me. What do you expect? It's not every day a man sees a flying saucer. Then you do believe him. Huh? Who am I to doubt it? Especially when radar reports confirm unknown objects flying at over 2,000 miles an hour. Colonel, do you believe in flying saucers? It isn't important what I believe, young lady. It's only important when men like your uncle can give us clear reports on what they've seen or found. Then over a period of time, we can eliminate the imaginary part and sift out the facts. Those facts will eventually do away with conjecture and become workable and usable knowledge. God willing. Well, I know I saw a flying saucer. Who knows? Maybe the Air Force knows it, too. Well, Mike, never can tell what you might see. 